Okay, so closing arguments. We're on day 12 of the Jonathan Majors trial, and we've already had defense closing and prosecution closing. I went through eight different court reporters to pull together all the different quotes they're pulling together and put them in the best order based on the timestamps. You know, some people take a little bit longer to type something out and get it published, but I tied it all together the best that we can, and we're going to go through it and get an idea of some of the points being made, the order they're being made in, and what the general argument that each side is making to the jury as their last argument. So Priya Chaudhry is delivering closing arguments for the defense. The arguments last over an hour. And by the way, I did try my best to cut out irrelevant narration or commentary from where I'm pulling the quotes from, but sometimes since we aren't hearing what's going on in court, we don't have a full transcript in front of us, some of the non-quotational context is important, such as when it indicates a video is being played or an image is being shown. So I did my best to combine what we've got in the best manner possible. Let's get started. So 10.36 a.m. Why are you here? You're probably wondering why you just spent the last two weeks of your life to see what is obvious to anyone interested in facts and evidence. Grace Jabari was not hurt when she got out of the car on Center and Canal Street. Jonathan Majors is innocent and Grace is a liar. There's no mystery about what happened in the car. The driver told us. So then Chaudhry is showing the surveillance video from the aftermath of the car incident. He puts her back in the car because they're in the middle of moving traffic. She keeps grabbing him. He tells her to leave him alone. He helps her out of the car. He walks her safely to the sidewalk. Grace ripped his coat with her bare hands, and there's no mystery about what happened after Jonathan finally escaped from Grace that night. She had a ball. And then Priya Chaudhry points out that Jabari was smoking illegally in a nightclub with her right hand, her left hand busy holding her glass of champagne. She was revenge partying. This whole trial has been about what happened in that car, even though the people want this trial to be about arguments from months and years ago. What happened in the car is obvious. The real mystery is what happened after Grace got home. These prosecutors bought Grace's white lies, her big lies, and all her pretty little lies. Just like the cops, and before any real investigation, prosecutors immediately decided who they saw as a criminal. They chose to contort reality and accept Grace's lies. They want you to see the world through their minds. Grace is a victim, and Jonathan is a criminal. The people need you to believe Grace's lies in order to convict this innocent man. You don't get to destroy people's lives with your fantasies. Grace is obviously an emotional person, but she cannot distinguish between her lies and her feelings. It's hard to keep your story straight when you're making it up as you go. If you believe Grace, then despite Jonathan Majors telling her how dangerous it is for a black man to call the police in America, despite that, he beat her badly in a car, and then he called 911 himself. If you believe Grace, then Jonathan caused these injuries, and then he told the 911 operator about her injuries, and then he told the cop who showed up at his apartment that they had an argument the night before. You probably have your own list of the greatest lies that Grace has ever told you. But I want to end this nightmare for Jonathan now, immediately, and as quickly as possible. It's just fake. Nothing she says makes sense. Nothing she says is medically possible. Everything she said is belied by the video. Let's ask another question. Where's the blood? This case is not about not reporting abuse. It's about not bleeding when cut. And this is unquoted, but Jabari had a gash on her right ear when the cops found her the morning after. But her clothes and the car, where the alleged assault went down, didn't have any blood on them. These are prosecutors. Prosecutors have a lot of power. They decide who should be criminals and who should be a victim. They decide who to charge with the crime. Grace is not on trial, but maybe she should be. That was objected to, it was sustained, and it was stricken. His fears of what happens when a black man in America calls 911 came true, and now we're here. You are here to end this nightmare for Jonathan Majors. You are here to see what is obvious, what the evidence shows, that Jonathan Majors is innocent. And then Jonathan sank down in his seat and wept. And then Priya goes to sit down at the bench, and she gives Majors, like, a sitting kind of hug, and she's dabbing her eyes, and defense has closed out their final argument. And then we get into the prosecution's closing arguments, which are delivered by ADA Kelly Galloway, and it's, everyone has been spelling her name wrong, like, all the articles that I read, it's, there's all these spelling variations, but that is the correct way to spell it. But right out the gate, she says that nothing you heard is evidence from Chaudhry. This case boils down to four words. Control? Domination, manipulation, 
and abuse. The trial is only about what happened at the car. You didn't see any evidence that the defendant was attacked whatsoever. And then not a quote, but from Cheyenne Roundtree. Galloway described Jabari as a victim of domestic violence, pointing to past incidents where majors used, quote, strategically planned methods to ensure Jabari's compliance, including the night of the alleged attack. Galloway accused Major's defense team of using Darvo tactics against Jabari. Back to quotes. Domestic violence is serious. Victims of domestic violence struggle to report, and when they do, there are critiques on how they do it. She didn't want to report to law enforcement, and she didn't call 911. And there's nothing wrong with appreciating the fact that the defendant called 911, but that does not dispute the fact that he assaulted her the night before. This case is the people of the state of New York versus Jonathan Majors. It is not Grace Jabari versus Jonathan Majors. And then no longer a quote, but... Galloway criticized the idea that this was about a scorned Jabari seeking vengeance over Jonathan Majors cheating. This is not consistent with the testimony that you heard. This is not a revenge plot to ruin the defendant's life, his career, to take everything away from him. The events and injuries are not consistent with the premeditated plan of revenge. Not a quote, but... Galloway noted Jabari didn't implicate Majors right away. Quote, she told the officers how she didn't know how she sustained the injuries. She went through days of grueling testimony. Why would she put herself through this? For what? What does she gain? I submit to you that her actions cannot be taken in an isolated vacuum. And then, Galloway said Jabari's testimony remained consistent throughout the case, including the fact that she chased Majors down the street because she needed closure over who sent the text message. When the defendant had behaved in a way that you were hearing previously, in public, he had told her not to speak about it to anyone, that it would ruin their relationship. Mr. Bari understood this. How did this impact her? She didn't want to tell anyone what was going on. And then Galloway plays the video surveillance footage of the beginning of the car video that we all saw yesterday. The defendant is picking up another human being as if she was a doll. Then Galloway argues that the sole witness to the encounter, who claimed he had a feeling that Jabari hit Majors despite not seeing anything, is not credible because he was being paid by Majors and knew him. He also testified that he was looking at the road. His testimony reveals him to be a biased witness to the man who paid him. As to Jabari chasing after Majors and dancing at a nightclub, the only thing that matters is what happened inside the car. Victims of domestic violence often respond in ways that seem to be abnormal. Then Galloway points to police body cam footage from the next morning, where Grace Jabari's finger is clearly injured, and she's shown using her hands similarly to the night before. And she closes out urging the jury to believe Grace Jabari, who testified for four grueling days reliving that night. And then right around 1 p.m., the prosecution's close is done. And I do want to disclaim again that, obviously, I'm working in direct quotes, but that whole thing was not direct quotes, and it's not complete. Right? So I'm only working with what we got. This is not a transcript. It is not a complete transcription by any means of the full arguments that either side delivered. It's basically just an exercise to take what's available and put it together in a way that we can kind of understand the flow and strategy of both sides' closing arguments. So at this point, it is 3.51 p.m. Jimmy said at 3.41 that the jury was deliberating. So we'll be on watch for that. And then I've got some thoughts, but... There's just a side-by-side -side talking about Priya Chaudhry breaking into tears as she ends her closing statements, her closing arguments, in defense of her client, Jonathan Majors. And shout out to Jimmy. Shout out all the way to Jimmy because he went last Thursday because we didn't think anyone was going to be there. And then he's been there. He was there yesterday and today again. Just showing up. And... For us, that was a big help to us, getting some context, some information, making sure that we heard what was going on last Thursday during Grace Jabari's cross-examination, which that's important, right? Because her testimony is critical in this case. And for us to understand at least somewhat what's going on behind the closed doors of that courtroom, if we don't have someone in there that's telling us what's going on, we wouldn't have had a clue on Thursday. But shout out to Jimmy for showing up, man. And then as far as some thoughts and analysis, we have, you know, in one of the filings, we have Priya Chaudhry lay out this, you know, deliberately placed sentimental photograph, a lit candle, intentionally stacked romantic items, a locked bathroom door, a uh, locked bedroom door, closed bedroom curtains, no answers, knocks, 
And you know, I'm not quite sure, but that looks like a suitcase to me. This is obviously the lower floor of the penthouse. So it was like three stories or whatever. And this is the first room you see when they walk in. And the suitcase is all the way down here. At least it looks like a suitcase. There's a stack of something on the bed. There looks to be a white pillar candle there. And the reason I say I think it's a white pillar candle is because it looks a little bit more like translucent towards the top as if some of the wax has melted in the middle. But I'm not sure how she was packing if this is all the way on the first floor and she locked herself in the bedroom. And even though there's a box there, they had... And even though there's a box there, she made a comment about not even being able to have decorated the apartment yet because they just moved in. So it's like, I don't even understand. I can't understand the suitcase thing. But when Priya Chaudhry said in her closing argument that the only mystery is what happened back at the penthouse that night, I mean, I agree. Like, we don't know. So we just have this picture here from 1134 a.m. on March 25th with a suitcase there sitting open. We know that she texted her friend that he tripped over the suitcase and she heard it, like, but she's all the way upstairs and couldn't hear the knocks. So how do you hear him trip over the suitcase, but you can't hear the knocks within that time frame? What, Priya's right. There's the mystery of what happened. And remember, they closed their case. They rested their case yesterday after bringing up Elon Rispoli to lay out the timeline that at 1045, Jonathan Majors is on the phone with him frantic. He gets to the apartment at some point. He starts knocking on the door 70 to 80 times. He's banging on it. No answer. No response. This is the bedroom door all the way upstairs. So that's when he gets the handyman. The handyman has to come and try to open the door. Handyman gets the door open. She's unconscious in the closet and there's blood on her ear. So Jonathan Majors is calling 911. He remains on that call for about four minutes and change. But at like three minutes and 36 seconds into it, you hear him say they're here, meaning the police, the first responders just showed up. And then by 1119... He and the officers are entering the closet where Jabari is laying still. So this photo is at 1134. So unless he moved this suitcase from somewhere else and then sat it there and opened it again, next to what looks like to be the candle that's described in this filing that Priya Chantry made, how did she hear him trip over the suitcase? So if the jury caught on, if the jury understood that timeline being laid out, I don't think they need to understand and have an answer to the mystery, but the fact that it is a mystery should be huge, I think, personally. Let me know what you think. The next thing I thought was interesting is that ADA Kelly Galloway says, this trial is only about what happened at the car. And by the way, it seems like when she says at the car, that she only means at car one, the first car incident. And the surveillance video that everyone watched yesterday only shows car part one. After they go around the corner, after Grace spoke with the strangers on the sidewalk, they end up getting into the car again. Then Jonathan Majors tries to get out one, the other side, the opposite side they enter in really quick. And this is apparently where she's grabbing at him and the white shirt is shown as she rips the buttons. Then they reconvene on the sidewalk. They try to get in the car one more time. This is where Grace Jabari gets her stuff and throws something on the ground and Jonathan Majors leaves for the night. And that was car three. So it's worth noting that ADA Kelly Galloway seems to be telling the jury that the only thing that matters is what happened at the car for car one, which is technically when Grace Jabari testified and the prosecution alleges the finger was pulled or the middle finger was pulled or twisted and that the laceration on the back of the ear was sustained. So fair enough. But on the other hand, it's not that fair when your closing argument involves all of this other stuff that don't have to deal with what happened during car one. Another thing I think is interesting, Kelly Galloway criticizes the idea that this was not about a scorned Jabari seeking vengeance over Jonathan Majors cheating. She says, this is not consistent with the testimony that you heard. But then Grace Jabari testifies over and over that all she cared about was finding out who the woman in the phone was. And then in the same closing argument, Kelly Galloway hones in on Grace's consistency. And she uses the fact that Jabari testified consistently about how all she cared about was knowing who those texts were from. She used that as her example of the consistency. So how do you how do you do both? You say that it's not consistent that this was about a scorned Jabari seeking vengeance over Jonathan Major's cheating, because that's not consistent with her testimony. But then you also say her testimony is consistent because she kept saying she was bothered by this other woman, this other text. I also think it's a weird thing to hone in on the fact that 
your key witness, Grace Jabari, was consistent in testifying that all she cared about was knowing who those texts were when the defense is also making this argument in their theory of the case in a different direction. Because they say that the reason Grace Jabari felt entitled to behave the way she did throughout the night was because all she cared about was seeing who the woman in the phone was and justified the chase, justified the, the grabbing and clawing at him. It just seemed like a contradiction within their own closing arguments to me. The next thing I think is interesting is that Kelly Galloway emphasizes that this case is about the people versus Jonathan Majors, not Grace Jabari versus Jonathan Majors, which is factually and legally true. That's true, right? But maybe it could come off as, don't pay attention to that witness. This is not about them and their credibility. And instead, focus on the people. When there's been some testimony that alludes to lazy or incomplete police work. And then there was also those questions about, you know, the prosecution paying witnesses to appear. So at the same time that it is legally and factually true that this is the people versus Jonathan Majors, I don't really know if I would want to tell the jury or highlight to the jury that they're supposed to decide between me and, and my police officers that we worked with to put this case together or the guy sitting over there. Like, I think it would have been smarter if, if they just let the jury, if they wanted to, think this is about giving some sympathy or empathy towards Grace. The next point I've got is Kelly Galloway emphasizing that Jabari didn't implicate Jonathan Majors right away because I need right away to find. You know, Galloway says she told the officers that she didn't know how she sustained the injuries. And that's technically true. She did say, I don't know what happened to my ear, what happened to my uh, hand, what happened to my finger. But at the same time, she also was the one that brought Jonathan Majors up. So at the same time, you're highlighting that Grace Jabari couldn't tell the officers the mechanism behind how she sustained the injuries, which is the case they need to prove. You're leaving out the bit about Grace Jabari being the first to bring up Jonathan Majors. What did he do to me? Did he hurt me? What happened to my finger? I'm so confused right now. What's going on? What's happening? So we have testimony on Tuesday on day 10 from Sergeant Hansen saying that Grace Jabari said she was struck in the head multiple times and that he used both hands to grab her around the throat. And then we know that Priya Chaudhry showed Jabari on her last day of cross-examination her signed signatures on different documents, and Grace Jabari had to confirm, that's my signature. And then we have testimony from Lucero, who accompanied Grace Jabari to Bellevue Hospital, that she wrote the second half of the page, that she signed the whole thing, but she also wrote the second half of the page. To me, it's not a strong look when you're supposed to be able to prove the mechanism that caused that you bear the burden to make the case, to prove your case of the alleged injuries and the mechanism you're saying caused those injuries. And here you're highlighting that she told people over and over that she doesn't know the mechanism of the cause of the injuries. And then slyly leaving out that she did right away, like within that couple of minutes before she goes to Bellevue, tells more than one person or indicates something about him. He. Did he. Did he do this? Did he hurt me? He hit me on the, on the head. He struck me on the head multiple times, put his hands around my throat, and now we have these sworn statements. Why would you do that? So maybe right away means like the very first thing out of her mouth. I don't know. Because it didn't take that long for her to start asking, was it him? What did he do? And another point is that Kelly Galloway says this isn't about revenge, and I have no idea if this was anywhere in evidence, because it is technically in the body-worn cam footage. This is from one of the filings, but we don't actually know if they got to hear any audio or see this specific part or if anyone was questioned about it. But in Officer Lucero's body-worn camera, as Mr. Bari is leaving Mr. Major's apartment, she asks if this will be in the press and is smiling and joyful in that conversation. It's my personal interpretation. She was not happy thinking she'd be famous. She probably didn't think she'd be named because the prosecution told her she could be anonymous as a DV victim. But this is more, to me, you're smiling because you know it'll get to him because you know he's a private person. I think she was smiling in this moment in this what's being described here out of some type of satisfaction that that'll be some type of get back for him, that this is going to be public. And you hear him in the end of the 911 call about keeping this confidential. It's in the recording, but it seems like he's saying it to the first responders that are there in person with him, like asking them if, please keep this confidential. So I also think four grueling days reliving that night is really interesting because there's been this back and forth of 
you know, opening statements told us it was about a pattern that culminated in one night that finally got physical. But now we're supposed to only think about it's only that night and not just that night, but only what happened at the car. And then the last thing. Remember, the prosecution is the one that bears the burden to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. But their closing argument is that the sole fact witness that was present in the car at the time of the injuries to observe what was going on, not an expert witness, not a treating physician that wasn't present when the, the injuries occurred or were sustained, but the sole witness that was present with Jonathan Majors and Grace Jabari in and at the vehicle, because it's in and at, they say isn't credible. So how can you prove your case beyond a reasonable doubt if your sole witness, and that's the prosecution's word, that Sarwar Naveed is the sole witness to what happened in and at that car? How can you say that you've proven your case beyond a reasonable doubt if you're calling him unreliable in your closing statements, suggesting that he's biased because he was paid by Jonathan Majors and knows Jonathan Majors, emphasizing that he couldn't have seen what went on, but not only that, but it's also interesting that they met with him on Sunday and had to disclose through email to the defense at 9.07 a.m., the morning he was set to testify, that they had met with him right before his testimony. And they'd also tried to discredit him in their 115-page filing in response to Priya Chaudhry's motion to dismiss, and that made it circuits in the news. So what does that mean if in your closing argument you decide to say that the sole witness, your words, is unreliable? What does that mean? So I have questions about that. Um, the jury is deliberating currently. So during jury deliberations, the jurors requested three things. First was a detailed explanation on each charge. The second was a video of the interaction on Canal and Lafayette outside of the car, Exhibit 5. Now that is not the beginning of the video. To be clear, this is, so Lafayette is the street where the three friends, the strangers, are met on the sidewalk. So this footage is from after they follow Majors off camera in that moment. There's the video of the button popping, and then there's also, it's described it on the sidewalk when the friends are all standing there with Chloe, I mean with Grace, that Chloe has to kind of like hold Grace back and talk her out of, talk her down a little bit. And then they also request the 911 call. So that's what they asked for. Although worth noting now that Josh Russell is correcting his own post to say that it is the Canal and Center Street video, which is the initial video. They're adjourning until 2.15 p.m. tomorrow because one of the jurors has a funeral to go to, or something similar to a funeral service of some sort. We can talk about that in the chat, or you'll be watching this after we've chatted. But let me know your thoughts on everything that's gone on. And I do think there were some holes in the prosecution's theory of the case and their closing. I think there were contradictions within the closing arguments that don't sit well together. But in general, I think that the prosecution always bears the burden of proof and they should always be scrutinized a little bit more than the defense. It's always good to analyze everything. But the person on the other end of the prosecution's argument has the right to a fair trial. So I think I have the right to be extra critical of the prosecution and how they got here. Let me know your thoughts. I'll post an update. I'm sure you'll see the updates everywhere once it happens, but you guys all take care.